Okay. So, um, and as I said, I said this before I started one of the recording things. So I'll say it again. Um, I'm downstairs right now and I don't have a whiteboard here and I'm going to be writing on paper instead and I've done that before and it worked okay. It should be even a little bit farther away. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, so the reading for today was basically about, um, Hume's theory of space. Is that kind of readable? Yeah, it's okay. Okay. Maybe I wish I had a thicker pen, but I don't. The pens are upstairs. Um it's just because this is this is our house cleaning day, and this is the second time our house cleaners have been back um, since before the pandemic. And right, I can't lecture upstairs while they're cleaning, so here I am down here. Um, okay, um, so. Uh, and I just want to remind you, so this is something that we're reading from the, from his earlier work, the treatise of human nature. Um, and that's because there isn't nearly as full a treatment of it in the inquiry as there is here. Um, what he does from what he does say about in the inquiry, it seems like he, He's thinking about it rather differently at that point. So in other words, the things I'm talking about here may be things that Hume actually changed his mind about later. Um, I think, you know, whether they are or not, they're, they're interesting. So I'm going to talk about them. Um, okay, so there are two parts of his system. The first one is the composition of extension. And actually, see, I said Hume's theory of space. Most of what he says here, he thinks applies to time as well as space. Um, and sometimes he discusses time separately. Um, I think it's easier to understand and perhaps the argument works better with respect to space than it does with respect to time. So I'm mostly going to be talking about that. Um, so anyway, extension, spatial or temporal expansion, extension really, out of a finite number of indivisible parts. So, this is uh, a view we already saw in Berkeley, of course, and they're both in disagreement with Locke on this view. Right? Remember, Locke thought that uh, um, extension is infinitely divisible. But uh, Hume agrees with Berkeley that that opinion of infinite divisibility of extension is actually weird and paradoxical, and, uh, and we would realize it was absurd if we weren't so used to um, believing it. So that's part one. And part two is, and Berkeley also agrees with this, that each of these parts has some quality and the quality is either a color or solidity. <laughs> 
right? So here, when say, in saying that it's either a color or solidity, he's he's really actually breaking extension apart into two different types of idea of extension, visible extension and tangible extension. Visible extension consists of indivisible parts, each of which has a color. Tangible extension consists of indivisible parts, each of which has solidity. Um, he doesn't say a lot about how visible extension and tangible extension are related to each other. Um, maybe I'll say something about that later. So, um, okay, so these are the two parts of the system. I mean, that's what he calls it, my, our system of extension. Um, and um, he's going to argue for both of them and also claim that they're connected to each other in a certain way. Um, I'm not going to, I'm going to give a summary of the argument now. Then I'm going to talk about certain consequences of the argument. Um, um, consequences for number one, the possibility of a vacuum, and number two, the consequences with respect to mathematics. Um, and then with whatever time is left at the end, I'm going to go back into the arguments for these two parts in more detail. Um, but I learned not to start with that because then the whole time can be taken up with that and I never get to anything else. So again, I'm just summarizing it to begin with. But to understand even the summary, you have to realize right away that this whole section is written from the point of view that external objects exist and they're represented by our ideas. Right, so even though he's going to agree with Berkeley and disagree with Locke about extension, throughout this um, section, he assumes that Locke is right about the relationship between idea, our ideas and their objects. Right, there's a mind that contains ideas and impressions in Hume's terminology. And these represent objects outside the mind. So this relationship is representation. And Hume assumes that the way they represent objects outside the mind is by resemblance. That is, our ideas represent things outside of our mind by resembling them. Now, um, this picture, which again is Locke's picture, basically, I mean, we'll see that the way he understands resemblance is a little bit different from the way Locke understands resemblance. But this is basically Locke's picture. Um, does this mean Hume thinks Locke is right? Well, uh, yes and no. I mean, we'll see in the reading coming up in part four of the treatise that um, Hume has a very strong uh, skeptical argument against this picture. But he also says, um, when introducing that strong skeptical argument, uh, by the way, you're not going to believe the conclusion of this skeptical argument. Right? So it's the same thing he said about the argument about cause and effect that we already saw in the inquiry. This is an argument. Um, It, it has two parts, but it's basically an argument against various versions of the view that there are external objects. Um, but he says to begin with, you know, you're not going to believe the conclusion, the skeptical conclusion. You're going to, as soon as 
I fi you finish following the argument and go back to living your life, you're going to once again believe there are external objects. And again, he doesn't make an exception for himself. Right? He also, ex except when he's in the midst of the skeptical argument, doesn't believe the conclusion. And that's why in this section, he takes for granted that there are external objects. As for why he takes for granted this particular version where our ideas represent external object by resembling them, that's, that's more complicated and we'll see what he says about that in part four. Um, okay, so that's the picture, but to understand um, what Hume means by this picture it, exactly, um, you have to understand how literally he takes this concept of resemblance. So, um, it's literal in the sense, first of all, that he says that our ideas represent visible and tangible objects as being of some size because our ideas have a size. So, I mean, so far Locke kind of agrees, right? Remember that um, Locke apparently explains how one idea can represent a longer extension than another, namely by being a longer idea, <laughs> um, right? Just like he explains how the idea of two represents more things than the idea of unity because it contains the idea of unity again. <laughs> so it's a, a more um, multiple idea and that's why it represents a more multiple object. Um, um, but Hume also adds that our ideas represent objects as colored or as solid because our ideas are colored or solid. So, um, our ideas really are the same kind of things as the external objects. External objects have a size and a shape and either color or solidity. And our ideas represent them because our ideas also have a size and a shape and a certain color and color or a solidity. The difference between them is just that our ideas are in our mind and the other things are outside our mind. Um, okay, so, um, that's kind of a little bit strange. Um, basically, Hume takes himself to have already shown uh, in previous parts of the book that, that actually, no, I guess he thinks he shows this in part three, so it's between this and what we're going to read from part four. But that I guess you might think a somewhat more somewhat less strange view, which we just say that our ideas are really different than the objects, but they resemble them in some sense. So like, I mean, that would be closer to what Locke means, at least what I claim Locke means by resemblance. When Locke says the external objects are something really different from our ideas, but there's like an analogy between them as one idea is to another. So some property of external object is to another. Um, Hume thinks that we can't understand that because we can't um, understand what we're talking about when we say that it might have some property that's really different from any of our ideas. Okay, so there's a question. Um, a point I'd like to ask because I wasn't certain. Does Hume believe that ideas are also accurate to their to the external body? Well, um, no. <laughs> so 
Um, not exactly, and that's going to be important in understanding this system. Um, but to understand exactly how he thinks they're inaccurate, um, I want to mention one other thing that you need to understand the whole argument, which is that Hume takes it that larger, strictly speaking, means has more parts. Um, I may have to change my location from down here to up there when they're ready to start cleaning down here. And I'm sorry if that would be kind of a weird disruption, but all right. We'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Um, larger, strictly speaking, means has more parts. Now, this is something that um, kind of seemed to follow from Locke's explanation. Right? Remember, uh, if you can, way back when, when Locke explains how simple modes are made by repeating the same simple idea over and over. Um, so like the simple modes of number are made by repeating the idea of an unit over and over again. And then he also gave an example how the idea of a furlong can be um, formed by repeating the idea of um, whatever that other unit that went into a furlong was, an L or something. <laughs> anyway, um, so, so, and that made us, made it seem like, you know, the modes of extension or space had to be formed like the ideas of number by repeating some unit over and over, and that one would be bigger than another if it contained more of that unit than the other, just the same as with numbers. Okay. I believe... Hold on a second. Um, yeah. Should I... Yeah. <laughs> All right, so so you'll have to excuse me while I carry my. Uh, this is eighteen minutes and eleven seconds, so I can edit it out of the recording. I'm just gonna carry. Oh, and the cats are gonna come upstairs too. Just going to carry everything else to me. I'm going to sit here. Okay, <laughs> it's 20.07.
So, um, right. So I was saying that um, this view that larger, strictly speaking, means has more parts sounds kind of what it seemed like Locke was saying about extension. That bigger extensions are bigger because they have more repetitions of some unit. Now, um, I when I talked about this part in Locke, I argued that that can't be exactly what he means. And I argued that basically because Locke thinks extension is infinitely divisible. <laughs> right? So therefore, he couldn't mean this. So um, Hume, on the other hand, does mean this. And he's going to use it to argue that extension is not infinitely divisible. So that all works out OK. But anyway. So the implication of this, if larger, strictly speaking, means has more parts, then um, nothing can be smaller than a simple thing. Right? A simple thing is a thing that only has one part. And since nothing can have less than one part, if there are any simple things, and larger, strictly speaking, means has more parts, then nothing can be smaller than those simple things. So in particular, if some of our ideas are simple, in this sense, indivisible, don't have parts, then nothing could be smaller than those ideas. So the conclusion, right? So, and Hume argues that we do have certain indivisible ideas, ideas that are not divisible into smaller parts. And um, therefore, we know of something which is as small as anything could be, namely some of our ideas. So, um, simple thing, you know, and I get simple, this is a little bit confusing because of the distinction between simple and complex ideas or simple modes and, and mixed modes. Maybe I should just say an indivisible thing. Nothing can be smaller than an indivisible thing, right? An indivisible thing can't be divided into parts, so it only has one part. So all the things I said before. Um, and we have indivisible ideas, according to you. So the conclusion is that although there may be, and Hume says in this section, there are things that are too small to see. Right, so he's not going to argue, as Barclay does, that there's no such thing as the 10,000th part of an inch, for example. Um, and, you know, he's able to not argue that because he's assuming this division that Barclay doesn't. So Hume is saying, here, this thing out here might be divisible into lots of parts, that are too small to see. Um, but, Hume says, there are, can't be things that are too small to imagine. Right? Because no matter how small these the parts of this thing are, they can't be smaller than my indivisible ideas. This, my indivisible ideas are as small as anything could be. So the very smallest parts of this external body are the same size as my indivisible ideas. Anyway, they can't be smaller. So I can imagine them accurately. That is, 
I can represent them with an idea that resembles them and in being indivisible. And that idea is exactly the same size as those smallest parts of this external body, resembles them exactly. So I can imagine them accurately. So why can't I see them? And the answer is, and this is, um, oh, I see April asked, so in this case, has more parts is not about being complex, but about, well, I mean, it is about being complex. It's just a different meaning of complex, I guess. Uh, I mean, remember Locke said that ideas of numbers are exa an example of complex ideas because they're composed of units repeated. So it's an example of complexity, but it's not, uh, it's not the kind of complexity that uh, what Locke calls a mixed mode has, right? Like. Uh, uh, courage is a complex idea, but it can't, like someone courageous or something courageous can't be split into parts corresponding to the parts of that idea. Um, okay, there's a lot more to say about that, but I don't want to get off track, so I won't. <laughs> okay, so anyway, um, Right, so it's you know complex in the way that a, a a simple mode is, as opposed to the way a mixed mode is in Locke. Um, okay, sorry. So so I was saying. So why is it that if I can accurately, if if there is, can't be a part of this body too small for me to imagine, how can there be a part that's too small for me to see? And this is where it comes in that this resemblance is not a hundred. This resemblance is not a hundred percent accurate. In particular, in general, external objects are much much bigger than they look. I mean, this is the really clever part of Hume's view here. I think. I mean, by clever, I mean like the most unexpected or strange kind of, but like, uh, you know, suppose a grain of sand is so small that I can't see any parts in it, but it actually does have millions and millions of parts. So my idea of the grain of sand has only one part. Right, I can't see any parts in it. So my idea of the grain of sand is the smallest anything could possibly be. The grain of sand itself has millions of parts. And larger means has more parts. So the grain of sand is much bigger than my idea of it. <laughs> it looks small, but it's really big. Um, so this part obviously is something that Barclay wouldn't accept, right? Um, and as for Locke, it's a little bit unclear. Of course, Locke does think that a grain of sand has parts infinitely smaller than anything I can, um, any part of it I can see. But, um, does he agree that my idea of the grain of sand doesn't have the same parts to it that the grain of sand does? And, um, I think the answer is that this is another sign that he has to 
that Locke has to think of modes of space really differently than Hume does. He can't think of them as made up of actual little parts. Th those parts actually obviously are not in the idea. Um, but, um, uh, the idea consists in a limitation of the simple mode of space, which as which necessarily admits of other limitations, even if I don't see them or something like that. Anyway, sorry, I shouldn't I, I shouldn't get sidetracked in trying to explain what Locke's view is here. But so um, so that is um, um, so that's a summary of Hume's view. In so far as it can, it concerns this strict standard of larger or smaller. So again, the view is that our ideas are are made up. Our, our ideas of extension are made up of indivisible parts. The indivisible parts are either colored or solid, um, and those ideas of visible or tangible extension resemble external things that are visible or tangible. The external things are also made up of indivisible parts. The indivisible parts are also of the external things are also either colored or solid. Um, and um, the, the, those indivisible parts of external things are the same size as the indivisible parts of our ideas. And the only discrepancy is that, in general, our, the idea by which we represent an external body is much smaller than the external body itself. That is, it contains fewer of those indivisible parts than the external body does. Um, Now, a consequence of this is that every external body is either um, exactly this, well, let's say if I compare two external bodies, oops, and I ask, is A bigger than B, smaller than B, or exactly equal to B? There has to be a definite answer. A and B are both composed of indivisible parts. All the indivisible parts are the same size, namely size one, right? Like the smallest possible size. And the question of which one is bigger or smaller is just the question of which has more of those in it. Um, or if they happen to have exactly the same number, then they're equal. Um, but of course, when we look at external objects in general, we can't see their indivisible parts. I guess we never can see their indivisible parts according to Hume. So, um, uh, if in order to tell which one of these was bigger or smaller or whether they were equal, we had to count the invisible parts, we would never know. And moreover, even when it comes to our own ideas, so these are bodies. Now, consider instead my ideas of bodies. So the bodies contain parts that I can't see and or feel. I guess I keep saying, I keep talking more about vision than touch here. Um, I guess Hume does that too, although he always keeps it open that it could be one or the other. Um, um, so anyway, um, it contains parts that I can't see or feel, and moreover, I can't even indirectly, you know, like by means of a microscope or whatever, find out about. They're just way too small. Um, and so I certainly, when I compare the size of, the, of two bodies, I don't do it by counting their indivisible parts. Now, in the case of my own ideas, of course, 
they don't contain parts that are too small for me to be conscious of or something like that because they're made up out of my ideas that I perceive. So in this case, I actually do perceive every indivisible part of the two ideas. So I could, in principle, if I want to know which idea is bigger, do it by counting the indivisible parts. But Hume says that even in that case, it's normally way too difficult to do that. It's very hard to focus on the smallest possible idea. And it's even harder to keep my attention on one smallest possible idea and on the one right next to it and on the one right next to that and so on and so forth in order to count them up. Um, while at the same time maintaining my focus on the, the the big idea that they're part of and not letting it change or whatever. He says, you know, it requires a huge effort of imagination to focus on ideas so minute. So normally, even we're comparing the size of ideas, we also can't do it by counting their indivisible parts. So, um, so this seems like bad news for Hume's theory because after all, we do constantly go around comparing the size of things, right? And we don't think we don't know which things are bigger and which things are smaller because we can't count their indivisible parts. So Hume says, um, and this is uh, book one, part two, Paragraph 22. By the way, not every uh, edition of Hume has the paragraphs numbered, but this one does. Um, and this is on page 36. Um, that's, oh, paragraph 22 is at the top. The only useful notion of equality or inequality is derived from the whole united appearance and the comparison of particular objects. This is just after he went through explaining why the strict standard, although it's correct or just as he often calls it, it's the just standard of equality or inequality, it's useless because we can't normally count all those indivisible parts. And he's saying, but, but there is a useful notion of equality or inequality, and it's derived from the whole united appearance and the comparison of particular objects. So the whole united appearance means that um, I don't count any parts. I want to know whether A or B is bigger. I just look at A and I look at B and I compare the way they appear to each other. And, and um, by comparison of particular objects, meaning like, um, I'm not apply, I guess what he means by that is something like, I'm not applying some rule that I could use in general to tell which things are bigger and which things are smaller. You have to show me some particular things and by looking at them or feeling them, I can tell which one is bigger and which one is smaller. So that's what we actually use to compare the sizes of bodies or ideas. Um, and what even is the relationship, first of all, between that, what he calls that loose standard based on the whole united appearance and the just standard based on counting the parts? Um, I think the relationship is empirical. That is, 
we only know from experience that there's any connection between this feeling we have from seeing two whole bodies, that one is bigger than the other, and the result we would get if we could count all their smallest parts. Um, and um, number two, it's um, whatever the relationship is, it's approximate. In fact, it has to be approximate because going back on the strict or just standard, two things have to be, um, if, you, if I'm given two bodies, one must be bigger than the other or they must be exactly equal. But on this looser standard, it's often just not clear which is bigger or whether they're equal. That, I guess, is part of what makes it looser, right? You can show me two bodies, especially if they're different shapes, and say, which one of these is bigger? And I say, well, I don't know. They, none of them, neither of them really looks a lot bigger than the other. And neither of them really feels a lot bigger than the other. And you say, so you mean they're exactly equal? And if I took off even the slightest bit of one of them, that would be the smaller one? No, they don't, you know, they can't look or feel exactly equal in that sense. It's just not clear which one is bigger. Okay, so that's the summary of Hume's system. Are there questions about that before I go on to discuss the vacuum and, and the basis of mathematics or the nature of mathematics? I guess there's not very many people here and therefore uh, less likely, even less likely than usual to be a question. <laughs> but okay, so I'll go on to talk about the possibility of a vacuum. Um, okay, so going back to the two parts of the system, this part is supposed to show that a vacuum is impossible. Um, so this is book one, part two, um, wait, I think I skipped one level when I said before where I was. This book, part, section, chapter. Okay, so book one, part two. Section 5, paragraph 1 on page 40. Excuse me. If the second part of my system be true, that the idea of space or extension is nothing but the idea of visible or tangible points distributed in a certain order, it follows that we can form no idea of a vacuum or space where there is nothing visible or tangible. So in the great debate of the early modern period about the possibility of a vacuum, it seems like Hume is lining up with the people who deny the possibility of a vacuum um, like Descartes, uh, Spinoza, and in a somewhat different way, Leibniz, against the people who say a vacuum is possible, like Locke. But it turns out um, that when you look more carefully at what Hume is saying, and this again is really clever and tricky. I mean, I guess I love this part of the treatise because 
And, but maybe this is what Hume himself didn't like about it later. I'm not sure. I love this part of the treatise because it's uh, consists of intricate arguments for really weird conclusions. <laughs> I mean, and it's it's interesting that Hume at the beginning of it seems to be talking about that. Only he projects it onto his opponents, right? Like the very first thing he says, whatever has the air of a paradox and is contrary to the first and most unprejudiced notions of mankind is often greedily embraced by philosophers as showing the superiority of their science, which could discover opinions so remote from vulgar conception. So, um, that's exactly what I'm saying. You know, uh, well, I guess, and um, on the other hand, anything proposed to us which causes surprise and admiration gives such a satisfaction to the mind that it indulges itself in these agreeable emotions and will never be persuaded that its pleasure is entirely without foundation. So I think, you know, that expresses the way I actually experience my relationship to Hume in this section. Of course, Hume is talk the, the outrageous, surprising opinion Hume has in mind in those two sentences, at least officially, is the infinite divisibility of extension, which he's going to argue against. But when you look at what views he establishes in set, instead, you know, like, for example, that a grain of sun, the, the reason I can't see the smallest parts of a grain of sand is because a grain of sand is so big. <laughs> um, uh, you know, that's surprising and interesting. Um, so similarly, what he does here in the case of a vacuum is that he argues against the possibility of a vacuum, but it turns out that what he means by a vacuum is impossible is actually much closer to the vacuum is possible side than to what people usually mean by the vacuum is impossible side. And in particular, he agrees with these two things. First of all, the air in a room could be annihilated. Without the walls moving, or coming into contact. Right, so you can have a room full of air, then somehow, conceivably, by a miracle, as someone um, more theologically inclined than Hume might say, but Hume might think will just say conceivably, the air in the room could disappear and not be there anymore. And, well, I guess I could say, I should say also, and without anything taking its place. So the air in the room has disappeared. Nothing else has moved in to where the air was. The walls haven't moved, and the walls don't touch each other. So that seems like saying there can be a vacuum, right? There's no air between the walls anymore. The walls don't touch each other. So there's nothing between the walls. And that's a vacuum. This, Hume, Hume says this is consistent with his view that a vacuum is impossible. And number two, he also agrees um, A body can move indefinitely. 
in a straight line. Um, without encountering resistance. And without any other body moving out of its way. Right? So we have um, body moving in a straight line forever. Nothing resists it. And no other body is moving to make way for it. So again, that sounds like it's moving through a vacuum. Hume says this is also consistent with his view according to which a vacuum is, quote, a, quote unquote, a vacuum is impossible. So how can these things be consistent? Well, so what he actually said was not a vacuum is impossible. What he actually said is we can form no idea of a vacuum. And what Hume is going to deny in both of these cases is that we have an idea. So he says, we don't have an idea of something that's between the walls now that the air is gone. We don't have an idea of something through which the body is moving. We have a lack of idea. Right? So, like, we have no idea of anything between the, the inside the room now that the air is gone. We have no idea of anything the body is moving through. Um, so, so far, this may seem kind of like a trick. Um, like, okay, what's the difference between having an idea of the absence and having an, having an idea of the absence of anything and having the absence of an idea of anything? Um, but they actually are pretty different. So, and you can see how different they are, I guess. Um, when you think about the relationship between the absence of the idea of something between the walls and the idea we previously had of something between the walls. So it's easier to talk about this using visible points rather than walls of a room, and that's how Hume talks about it. But I, or I guess you could also imagine these to be tangible points. So there's a tangible point here and a tangible point here. So I have an idea of this tangible thing, and I have an idea of this tangible thing. That is, you know, when I touch this, I get an impression of a solid thing. And then when I touch this, I get an impression of a solid thing. Um, but, um, and, you know, when I'm not actually touching them, I have the idea that it's a copy of that impression that somehow I use to, like, remember that I had that impression. But um, as I move my hand in between these two, I don't get any impression at all while it's between them. That is, I don't get any impression of touch at all while it's between them. Of course, I get other impressions of, you know, like the movement of my muscles and stuff like that. But I don't get an impression of something touching my finger as I move between here and here. So contrast that with the situation that the space between these two points is filled in with something. 
So now I feel something touching my finger here. And as I move, I continue to feel something touching, 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 and I get to this one. So what we want to say, and what we would say if we really believed in a vacuum, the way Locke does, for example, is that this empty space is exactly the same size as this body. Right, I'm, obviously I'm assuming that I guess one way to, to imagine you can imagine this as like before and after. First, I had the two tangible points, and then a body came in. Maybe it moved in. Maybe it was just created there. Hume says motion and creation are basically the same thing. Before there wasn't something there, and now there is. <laughs> so one way or another, a body has come in here, but meanwhile these two points haven't moved. How do I know they haven't moved? I was feeling them the whole time. I didn't feel them moving, whatever. So these two points haven't moved, but meanwhile, there's a body in between. So if I really believed in a vacuum the way Locke does, I would say that this empty space here had a certain size. It was exactly the size of this body. And that's why this body could move between these two points, and these points didn't have to move to get out of its way. But Hume says um, what we have here is just two completely different situations. One, a situation where there's these where I feel one thing here and then I don't feel anything don't feel anything, and then I feel something else here. And another situation where I feel something here, and I feel something, feel something, feel something, and feel something here. Um, how do I know that um, A body that say it took that a body it takes my finger the same amount of time to go across as it took to go from here to here will fit in here without these moving and Hume says it's empirical I know by experience that if I have a body out here and let's say I'm moving my finger at a constant speed I know by experience that if the time it takes my finger to move from one end to this body of this body to the other is, you know, say one second, and the time it takes my finger to move from here to here is one second, and I didn't feel anything in between, I know that this body, that, that this situation can be replaced with this situation. And moreover, I know that if there's two bodies, that are the same size, and one of them can be, I can, so here's two bodies that are the same size, A and B. If from situation one, I can get situation two, where body A is between these, then, and only then, could I also get situation three, where B is between these. And again, like assuming in, in both cases they haven't moved. And it's because of that that I'm tempted to say that there's a certain that there's a certain size of something in situation one. 
that is it's because I can replace this situation by one where there's something of a certain size in between the two points. And that size is fixed. So anything else that can go in there is that size also. That I start to think of this nothing as having that size. But Hume says, actually, it doesn't have any size. How do I know it doesn't have any size? Well, um, it doesn't have parts. How many parts does it have? Well, how many parts does my idea of it have? Zero. I don't have an idea of it. <laughs> so there's no parts of anything in here because there's nothing. That is, I don't have an idea of anything in here. Therefore, I don't have an idea of any parts in here. So um, I, don't, I don't believe there are any parts in here. There's zero parts. So it has no size. These bodies have size because they have parts. And I use them, so to speak, to measure. But again, it's not strictly speaking to measure because when I use one body to measure another, I do it by putting the put points of one body, the parts of one body next to the parts of the other body. And I'm doing that because the strict standard of equality would say if they have exactly the same number of parts, they're equal. This thing, again, can't be measured in that sense because it isn't a thing and it doesn't have parts. This relation between the two points, that's what's really there. There's a certain configuration of the two tangible points. That's what's really there. That relation can be kind of quasi-measured and quasi-divided into parts by virtue of the bodies that I know by experience could go in there. Okay, is that, again, I know there's so few people here that I can't, even what I, if what I said is completely incomprehensible, I can't necessarily expect a question, but, um, is that clear enough so far? Um, but now here's the weird thing about this. Um, and I guess just maybe before I even go on, I wanna show you in the text that this really is what he's saying. Um, so this is book one, part two, section five, paragraph 11 on page 42. So here he's talking about a visible, not a tangible case. Right? There's two points of light, and I don't see anything else. And he says, um, that, I mean, he imagines starting off in total darkness, and he says, that's a situation where I literally don't see anything. He says, I'm seeing the same thing a blind person would see. That's surprising. Locke wouldn't agree with that, but, but that's what he says. I'm in, in total darkness. I'm seeing nothing. And now imagine these two points of light appear. And he says, nothing has changed except those two points of light. Other than that, I still don't see anything. This is not only true of what may be said to be remote from these bodies, and he says what may be said to be remote from these bodies because there, there really is no distance. I don't see anything other than those two luminous bodies. 
but what may be said to be remote from these bodies, but also of the very distance which is interposed betwixt them, that being nothing but darkness or the negation of light, without parts, without composition, invariable and indivisible. Right, so all the darkness, that is all the visible vacuum, is um, um, here he calls it indivisible, but that would suggest that it has one part. I think what he actually means is it has, as I said, it has zero parts. It's indivisible because, not because it's as small as something could possibly be, that is, has one part, but because it's nothing, and so it can't be divided into parts. Nothing can happen to it, <laughs> right? So, um, um, Okay, so that's what he's saying about a, a so-called vacuum. And so you can see that I think it actually is pretty different. This claim that, that what I have here is the absence of an idea actually is pretty different from claiming that I have an idea, a positive idea of empty space. But moreover, it has weird consequences given Hume's theory about that I just finished explaining about how we judge larger, smaller, and equal. Because when we say that, um, we know bodies of a certain size and no others can fit between these two. And I guess also, what we also know is that two other points that have the same appearance as these two, these same bodies will fit between them. When we say that, we're not going by the just, precise standard of equality. Right? That is, we don't have experience that if this body has a certain number of smallest indivisible parts, then another body that's going to be able to go into that between these two. See, I keep wanting to say fit into this space, which, I mean, is the way we would normally describe it. And I think Hume will say, yeah, it's fine to describe it that way. But, um, but strictly speaking, there isn't, a space that something can go into. There's nothing, <laughs> right? So we want to say instead is can be introduced into point into a situation where there's just points in this configuration such that it will be between them and they won't move. That's what we really mean when we say it could go into that space, it could fit into that space, right? So when, when, when we experienced that only a body of a certain size could do that, we didn't experience that in the strict sense of a body with a certain number of indivisible parts. Because we don't know how many indivisible parts bodies have, and even our ideas, we don't normally know that. So what did we mean? Well, obviously we meant by the whole, we meant, you know, if two points have judging by the whole appearance, have a certain look to them, then a body that has a certain look to it can be introduced between them. And the other bodies that can intro be introduced between them will also look the same size. But remember, you know, now that we're using the loose standard, like the same size is kind of... Um, um, there's lots of bodies that kind of look the same size, but you're never sure which of them are exactly the same size. Um, so what's interesting about this is that um, basically, Hume's, all of Hume's arguments about the indivisible parts of extension don't apply or don't apply in any direct way to the 
quasi parts of this quasi extension. It doesn't have, because the reason we're describing it as of a certain size is all based on the loose standard and not at all on the just standard. Because it's all based on experience of what bodies can go in there. And experience only reveals the loose standard in general. Um, there's no reason to say that this empty space, so to speak, consists of some definite number of smallest indivisible parts. So it seems like um, um, if what you thought was that empty space is infinitely divisible, and you maybe are willing to admit that bodies consist of atoms, then again, Hume is not exactly proving you wrong. Okay. Um, that's, there's, I, I'm sure I could say more things, but that's what I wanted to say about a vacuum. Now, what time is it? Okay, so I'm going to, yeah, I'll say a little bit about mathematics. Um, so what Hume says about mathematics in general is, or about the implication of his view for mathematics is, um, and this is book one, part two. This is actually, um, or yeah, book one, part two, section four, paragraph eight on page 33, at the top of page 33. There have been many objections drawn from the mathematics against the indivisibility of the parts of extension. So remember, I think when I talked about Barclay's view, I explained what kind of objections those might be, like the irrationality of the diagonal relative to the size of a square, etc. Though at first sight, that science seems rather favorable to the present doctrine. And if it be contrary in its demonstrations, is perfectly conformable in its definitions. My present business then must be to defend the definitions and refute the demonstrations. Right, so what Hume is going to claim is that um, mathematicians start with the right definition of, I love mathematics, of point, line, and plane. And, um, but then somehow they end up demonstrating things about them that are not exactly true. But it's not that a mistake is made at some particular point in the demonstrations, right? That, like, so Hume's not going to go through Euclid and go look at every demonstration and say, aha, here's your mistake here, Euclid. Here's your mistake here. Um... Rather, it's a general mistake, and the general mistake, this is on the next page, page 34. Um, because with, with regard to such minute objects, they are not properly demonstrations, being built on ideas which are not exact and maxims which are not precisely true. Um, so what that means is that mathematics, and Hume says in context, says this, I think, more explicitly, Mathematics doesn't operate with the just or strict notion of um, larger or smaller. Mathematics meaning geometry in particular, right? He's not talking about arithmetic here. Um, and I guess, I mean, 
how could there be an objection from arithmetic to a doctrine about the divisibility of extension, right? So he's talking about geometry, and he's saying that geometry um, um, doesn't operate with that strict standard of larger and smaller, namely that one thing is larger than another if it contains more indivisible parts. Um, and it also doesn't operate with a strict conception of straight. Um, so when I say, or of right angle, so when I say a square is a figure with four equal sides, four equal straight sides that meet at a right angle. Hume says that when I call the sides equal, I'm not using the strict standard, I'm using the loose standard. Equal sides are sides that look equal. And moreover, when it comes to straight or right angle, Hume claims that we don't even have a strict standard of that. He says, sure enough, there must be something about the way those indivisible parts are ordered that causes the appearance of a straight line. And there must be something about the way they're ordered that causes the appearance of a right angle. But he says, we don't know what that is. <laughs> um, we can't concentrate on those small ideas enough to figure out what the disposition of them is that corresponds to what we call straight or right angle. And therefore, we can't give a definition of straight or of right angle. But again, how do we classify things as straight or right angle? Well, not by examining the disposition of their little tiny parts, just by the overall appearance. It's a loose standard. It looks straight. So Hume says all of geometry is based on these loose standard notions of the loose standard of size and the, and the loose standard, which is the only standard of straightness, curvedness, right angle, etc. And therefore, even though the definitions are in their own way fine and the maxims, that is axioms, are true enough, they could be precisely true. So this is a little bit different from Barclay, and it's, uh, uh, but it's an important difference. So Barclay claimed that the principles of mathematics are strictly speaking false. They're strictly speaking false, and they're false by a particular amount in any given case, right? So according to Barclay, you know, any particular square has a particular number of indivisible parts in each one of its sides. And if you draw a diagonal, that has a particular number of parts. And that means that the Pythagorean theorem can't be precisely true. Right, because again, because that would mean that if, if there's m parts in the side and m in the diagonal, that would mean that m squared equals 2n squared, and that's impossible. So rather, you know, m squared is close to 2n squared, but not exactly, and the amount it's off is going to be um, larger the smaller the square is, right? Till you get to a square like this, and it has no diagonal, according to Barclay. Or, I know, maybe you could call this the diagonal. And in that case, if you call this the diagonal, the diagonal has the same number of parts as the sides, right? Each side has two parts, and the diagonal also has two parts. So, so for this tiniest square, m squared equals n squared. And then when you make the square a little bit bigger, 
I guess here m squared still, still equals to n squared, but So now, what's the diagonal? Hmm. Wait, is m squared always get, is m always going to equal m? That can be right. All right, I should have figured this out ahead of time. I think Barclay thinks <laughs> that when the square gets bigger, this gets closer to being true. But I'm having hot trouble drawing it so that that comes out right. I guess you have to think of it as not on a grid. Yeah, I mean, so you have to think of it Well, okay, sorry. I don't want to get into that farther. But so Barclay thinks that, that, you know, the Pythagorean theorem, strictly speaking, is not true. It's never exactly true. It's always a little bit off. Hume thinks it's never exactly true, not because it's always a little bit off, but because it's not really about exact quantities. There is no such thing as exactly equal lines by the loose standard. And there is no thing, such thing at all as exactly straight. So he has a whole explanation of how, and I'm not going to go into the details of this, but hopefully if you do want to understand it, I think this would help you understand what's going on here because it's confusing. But he has an explanation of how because we have ways of correcting the loose appearance to make it more precise. And I think, you know, what more precise means is that, um, at least as far as size is concerned, more precise means something like it brings it into better possible conformity with the just or strict standard. Um, but anyway, like whatever that means exactly, we have ways of correcting our initial judgment. I think that looks pretty straight, but I'm not sure. And I have ways of testing more exactly. Because I can do that, I form this fiction that there would be, it would be possible to correct it completely. So there would be always be an exact answer to whether the line is straight or not, or to which of these two lines is bigger or whatever. But in fact, the loose standard just doesn't allow for that. It can't be infinitely corrected. It can be corrected somewhat, but that's the most you can say. So according to Hume, the theorems of mathematics, none of them are exactly false in any case. They're just never exactly true either because they're not about something exact. And Hume says, you know, in everyday practice when, of course, we only use this loose standard anyway because it's the only useful standard, that's fine. It really only causes problems when we turn to metaphysics, right? And like try to use it to, pr to prove that there could be an infinite number of things in a finite space or something absurd like that. Okay. Um, are there questions about that? So I see there's really only about 10 minutes left to go into further details here. And the question is, Okay, so I think, I mean, there's two things I could talk about. One is to go into 
further detail in his argument for part one. I think I gave a pretty clear summary of what the argument is, but I think if I went through it step by step, uh, it would become clearer exactly how it's supposed to work. Um, but since that would be pretty long, I think I'm going to talk about the other thing, which is the relationship between these two parts. So Hume says this one is, in a way, a consequence of that one. Sorry, you couldn't see what I pointed to there. But this one, namely, that each of the parts has some quality, color, or solidity, um, is a consequence of this one, namely, that extension is composed of a finite number of indivisible parts. Um, so this is on page 31. It's um, Book one, part two, section four, paragraph two. Um, these, indiv these indivisible parts being nothing in themselves are inconceivable when not filled with something real and existent. So um, he's saying because the smallest parts are indivisible and don't have any parts, they're inconceivable unless they're filled with something and the thing they can be filled with is color or solidity. By the way, how do we know that the only things they could be filled with are color and solidity? And I don't think Hume ever says, but it's a good question. I mean, for one thing, there's the thing I keep mentioning, which has been causing trouble ever since Locke, I think, about heat and cold. Why can't they be filled with heat and cold? Um, but why couldn't they even be filled with smell, let's say? How do we know that for sure? So Hume is going to assume that in parts of his argument later. Um, and he's, he's going to say, well, it's just absurd. Smells don't have position relative to each other. Um, tastes don't have position relative to each other. They can't be combined to form a shape or a size. Um, I'm not even sure that's obvious. I mean, you kind of feel tastes sometimes like spreading in your mouth or whatever, but even assuming that that's true of our experience, how do we know that that will be true in the future? So, okay, I don't know. Anyway, that's, but Hume says, so it has to be either color or solidity. Why is that? Why is the fact that they're indivisible mean that they have to be filled with something or else it's inconceivable? Well, that's an argument he makes um, in the previous section, and, or it's based on something he says in the previous section. No, I guess it is an argument he makes in the previous section. For the idea of extension consists of parts. So, um, so the thought is this, that if you if you ask me, like, what is here, I'll say, well, it's an extended thing. And what I mean by it, it's an extended thing is that it has parts. Now, of course, not just any parts, but parts in a certain disposition or order. Although, again, we can't say exactly what that is. We can't define it. Um, 
but it has parts in a certain disposition or order relative to each other. And now I say, okay, well, but what are those parts like? So at first, if I divide it into, say, this part and this part, I can say, well, those parts are just like the whole was. They're extended things. But, um, but as a consequence of the first part of the system, as a consequence of the first part of the system, I'm not going to be able to say that forever. According to Locke, I could say that forever. Right? In other words, when I, according to Locke, if I say, if you ask me, what's this? I can say, well, this is a simple mode of space or extension. And then you say, oh, well, does it have parts? And I say, yeah, sure. It's divided into parts or it can be divided into parts. And then you say, well, what, okay, what are the parts like? And I say, well, the parts are simple modes of space or extension. And I can keep saying that forever. But in Hume's case, I can't keep saying that forever. Eventually, I get to parts that are not extended because they don't have parts in a certain disposition. They don't have parts at all. They're indivisible. And now you say, OK, well, what's this part like? What kind of part is it? And I can't say it's extended because it's not. So if I can't say it has a color or it has solidity, then I have to admit that it's nothing. It's not extended. It's not colored. It's not solid. It couldn't be any other of those other qualities because those, you know, can't be in this disposition, right? Like smells or tastes or whatever. So it's nothing at all. Um, or I think maybe to put it a little bit more clearly, you can say that like if a body is something with, um, like a body or a, a, a mode of extension, according to Descartes, and an empty mode of extension, according to Locke, is something that has no properties except size and figure. But an indivisible point is not something that has no properties except size and figure. An indivisible point is something that has no size or figure. Um, Size and figure are possible because I can put these things that have no size or figure into a certain order. Okay, as Hume says on page 31, this is the last thing I'd be able to say. Um, okay. That's 51. Oh, sorry, this was right after the thing I read before. The ideas of space and time are therefore no separate or distinct ideas, but merely those of the manner or order in which objects exist. So, um, right, so I can have ideas of size and figure because something can be put into a certain order or can exist in a certain manner. But what? not something that itself has size or figure. It must have some other property, and what can that be? And the answer is it must be either color or solidity. Okay, so we'll actually see that this has a role in Hume's skeptical argument um, in the reading for next time. Or is it for the time after? Anyway, in, in the reading from part four, um, and I will...
um, talk to you about that tomorrow. <laughs> okay, see you then. Thank you once again for coming, those who, who showed up. Bye.